Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, very proud to see you all back. We're really proud. Every year we have, uh, we are asking ourselves, will, will they, and that's you, will they come? And uh, yes, you come. And uh, every year uh, you're coming with more. Uh, we have all kinds of uh, mechanisms to monitor the, um, the coming of they, and they are coming, and we're so proud. Um, we're in May. It's, uh, it's actually an easy month. Everything in Brussels looks better. Um, and so uh, they who came in January, I worship you. And they who are here now just enjoy, I would say. So Brussels is a, it's kind of a rough city. This used to be, 100 years ago, a very expensive neighborhood, um, full with uh, the, the girlfriends of our royal family. Uh, they got houses and they were all here. And some of that ancient, um, uh, um, some, of that, some of that is still here. We have a beautiful garden. And so my May recommendation will be, it's open the garden today and tomorrow, not on Friday. So have your lunch there. It's a beautiful, romantic garden. So don't go alone, because romanticism can hit hard when you're alone. So try to go in company. Huh? But so uh, then there's another venue. There are three venues this year. Um, and the other venue starts with an earlier uh, lunch. And so you might go for efficiency. And we will open the window. So there is outside too. Just mix. I, I wrote. Um, an opening letter in last year's brochure on shoes. What kind of shoes should one wear at CPDP? And this year I just did it. I bought very expensive marathon shoes. And um, it's not trendy, it's just efficiency. There are three venues. Two are outside there. They're close to, one, uh, to each other. But there's a lot of, if you want to catch panels, uh, do. And uh, just uh, from tomorrow on, put your marathon shoes on and run with me. Um, there is no secret, there is no division of uh, spiritual division between the three venues. Um, it's not that Les Halles is formal because it's big and Area 42 is, small, is uh, informal or whatever. No. Uh, so there's a, a good mixture. There are two panels running here, one downstairs, one here. And there is a culture club event there with a lot of interesting things. You have to read the program very carefully, but amongst others, scientists presenting their preferred books during lunchtime. So um, if you're not into romanticism in the garden, go for an intellectual lunch with uh, people that show you what books they like, and, and so on and so on. So there's much to explore um, in the booklet, in the program, um, and in those three venues. And, uh, and as I uh, I still have to uh, look around for what I'm going to do. You all have a, uh, this kind of thing, and behind there's a, a, a QR code, QR code. One day, in the name of human rights, we're going to forbid those things. But if you focus on it with whatever scanner, you have the program digitally. Um, and then, then what? What's the advantage of the digital? Uh, if you believe big tech, there's many advantages. But we, the older academics, know it's not true. This paper gives you synthesis, deeper comprehension, but it's a lot of work. Whereas if you use the, the code, you can just click on every panel and know more. So the accessibility of the data is indeed in the digital. And we even use soft AI because if you go to a panel, this thing recommends you similar panels. So if you want to remain in a bubble, yeah, um, follow the AI instructions. If you don't want to uh, live in a bubble, just go blindfoldedly uh, from one panel or venue to another. So that's a long introduction. Now, uh, about the artwork that is here. Huh? Uh, in the booklet on page 67, we introduce a, an, Aus an Austrian artist, and her name is Judith Feger. And she, we like, well, Thierry, uh, our art program, programming director, we, um, uh, we like the minimalism of the uh, artwork of CPDP. And this is uh, all, uh, it's, a, it's a work on uh, resistors. It's what makes the digital world function. And it's very simple. These are the things through which power passes and through which ideas pass. So we kind of like that as a, 
as the back office of our world of digital ideas that we are presenting today. Now, I made a PowerPoint. This is the artwork that I, and I invite you to, uh, um, and, the, and there's a good thing about it. The money of this work goes to the Ukrainian uh, people. So we, we're good on that too. Our moral conscience is good. A short work on the resistance work. Um, uh, but so on, on why being here, I, I, I can only appreciate those that came also from the business community. After the um, decision of the Irish DPA on Monday, there are many questions about transatlantic data streams and so on. And I think, and probably many, many, many businesses around Europe will ask you, um, what's next? What are we going to have to do within the upcoming six months? I think this is the place to reflect about that important question. So, um, um, and, and one of the answers might be these, these negotiations. Um, no, I'm, uh, I went too far. Yep. Yeah, so uh, the EU US data privacy framework might be the solution, but they will have to hurry up with the, um, with the timeline. Huh? So uh, that's why you should come to CPDP, also from a business perspective. There's a lot to learn, and we have, there are many open standing questions, and we will not have them all ready for you today. But there are panels on the transatlantic today in this venue and in other venues, uh, one of them being late afternoon with Chris Kuhner moderating. So that's, that's one of the reasons to come to CPDP. Um, but it's also showing you that there is a, a learning perspective that, is, um, that uh, can best be uh, approached by being together and sharing ideas. Now, these are the three venues. Now, they will be, um, there will be enough signals, and the M Villa is next to Area 42, so you won't have any difficulties in finding those. These are the maps. It's a good walk, one, two, three, three minutes walk. And, um, and what's the idea? The idea is to put all the workshops and the more interactive stuff in M Villa, so explore that. If you don't like the traditional setup of CPDP with speakers, panels, and audience, but you want to have a voice too, which is, there are Q and A's of course, but in the M Villa, all these concerns about my voice should be taken seriously uh, in, in the workshops that are organized there. So I would recommend you to explore that one too. Um, we have Wi-Fi, we have the whole bunch. As I said, there's an early lunch in area 42. The, the lunch here will start at one. Um, there is a, we used La Petite Halle, which is the venue over there for the culture uh, club, uh, concentrating a lot of activities and presentations with, a, with an itch, with, a, uh, with something uh, around it. We present artists uh, over there, and I will definitely uh, spend all my money in the bookshop like I did last year. Um, so that those are, so that the book stand present, uh, fascinating scientists presenting um, uh, the, their favorite books, the Code Project. This coffee everywhere, also espresso coffee over there for the snobs, those wearing marathon shoes. There is an espresso machine over there and one there, and uh, I had two already. And uh, to, uh, tomorrow night there will be a Pecha Kucha, which is a, a format of presenting art in images that we have uh, organized since the beginning. It is fun to see people presenting their work, even intellectual abstract work through images. And of course, there is a, a party which ruins Friday morning from a conference perspective. So don't go. Huh? So come to the conference. Don't go to the party. Yeah. Or go. Huh? Um, and these are all the people we, we, we love, with whom I have uh, been drinking a lot of coffees in the past years. It is, they're all present in Brussels. So I think this is a, this is a conference about data protection from the Brussels perspective, which is a, uh, also a global perspective. And so we are also happy with all the non-Europeans that made it to CPDP. And if there are uh, jet lags, come to us. We have uh, accommodations for those if you want to take a little nap. Uh, we publish books and booklets, and, and that is it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy you made it here. Um, I will... Um, uh, um, there is, um, uh, I'm not going to say what to pick or what to do. That is your own. Or people are, other people are already in Area 42. So uh, make your choice, uh, but be open-minded and explore a little bit. 
On the formal side, there is a, a press conference by the European Data Protection Board tomorrow, which they hold, which will be held in La Cave. And that's the way we collaborate with all the partners in Brussels, the institutional ones and the non-institutional ones. And I'm very thankful for that. But my thanks goes to you for being here because addressing an empty forum is not so much fun. One of our best panels is starting now. So please, Kathleen, come with your crew and uh, enjoy your conference. Thank you. Good morning. We will give uh, those moving about uh, just a, a second to rearrange seats, and then we'll get started. All right. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much uh, for being up bright and early uh, to, to join us for this morning's panel on global AI governance from policy to practice. Uh, my name is Caitlin Fennessy. Um, I am the Vice President and Chief Knowledge Officer at the IAPP, the International Association of Privacy Professionals. Um, and I am, I am really uh, excited and, and honored to be joined uh, by this panel here in Brussels. I, uh, if, if I've met you before, perhaps you know I moderate a lot of panels, but I don't say that lightly in this case. Uh, we have such uh, an international uh, group here, and uh, uh, I, am, I am so thrilled that they all um, thought this was important enough to, to join us here in, in Brussels. Uh, to talk not only about uh, the policy perspectives, but how um, organizations are working to translate AI governance into uh, operational practice here today. So please let me uh, introduce them, and I, I think you will then understand, uh, if you don't already, why uh, I'm really excited about our discussion. So. Uh, let me just go from, uh, from my left uh, to right here. Um, uh, Denise Wong, uh, thank you for being with us, is the Deputy Commissioner Designate of Singapore's Personal Data Protection Commission. While she is already doing the work, she formally uh, will take on the role in July. So thrilled she's joining us so early in her tenure. Uh, but prior uh, to uh, this new role for her, she was the cluster director of the Strategic Policy and Operations Cluster in Singapore, where she led the legislative amendments to tackle online harms on social media and oversee teams that regulate misinformation and scams. And so uh, that will be obvious uh, to you why uh, she is, is no stranger to some of the issues that, that AI is, is raising. Um, next to her, we have Kareen uh, Perset, who heads the AI unit of the OECD Division for Digital Economy Policy. She focuses on opportunities and challenges that AI raises for public policy, um, on policies to help implement the OECD AI principles, and on trends in AI development. Uh, thank you for being with us. And, and next to uh, Kareen, we have Dennis Hirsch. Uh, Dennis is a professor at The Ohio State University, where he holds a joint appointment in the College of Law and Com the Department of Computer Science, and where he is a core faculty member of the Transatlantic Data Analytics Institute. Uh, he directs Ohio State University's program on data and governance, which focuses on the governance of advanced analytics and AI and co-directs a community of over 100 researchers focused on ethical and just 
uh, use of AI. Thank you so much for traveling to Brussels, Dennis. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, Yuha Haikila, who is an advisor for AI in the European Commission's DG Connect, where he leads international work. He has uh, been instrumental in developing uh, the 2018 AI strategy and coordinating uh, the plan on AI amongst uh, a whole lot of other work. So uh, thank you to everyone um, for being with us this morning. Um, and so before I uh, dive in uh, to, to my questions, uh, I don't think it, it requires any explanation why this panel topic is either timely or important. I understand uh, we are actually uh, up against uh, Sundar Pichai, uh, Google's CEO, who is speaking right now on the same topic here in Brussels uh, during a, a fireside chat. So clearly this is on everyone's mind, whether in uh, policy or industry. Uh, but let me just quickly explain my connection uh, to the, the subject matter. Um, at the IAPP, uh, we, we have certainly also recognized the importance of AI governance and uh, thought a lot about what it means from the more professional standpoint. Um, and so just last week, in fact, we announced uh, the creation at the IEPP of an AI governance center dedicated to supporting the growing and emerging profession of AI governance. So we will do for AI governance everything that the IAPP already does for privacy. So we will support the professionalization of that space by putting out uh, news and research. We launched a new AI governance newsletter I'm losing track of time. Things are happening so quickly. Last week, uh, I believe, sign up. It's free if you're interested. Um, we will launch a certification and training by the end of this year. We will today open a call for proposals for a fall uh, uh, AI uh, conference, and all of this uh, we are uh, advised by an incredible uh, advisory board of, of AI uh, leaders and those thinking about governance, and, and two of them are on stage with us, uh, Denise and, and Dennis, so I am, I am so grateful. But let's, uh, let's turn to the, the topic at hand. Uh, uh, governments around the world uh, for, for quite a number of years now, uh, not quite a number, but, but several for sure, have been trying to think through what AI governance means uh, from a policy perspective. In 2019, we had the launch of the OECD AI principles. Also in 2019, Singapore's model AI governance framework was released. The European Commission proposed the AI, uh, EU AI Act in uh, 2021 and in 2023, just at the start of this year, uh, the US government's NIST, National Institute for Standards and Technology, proposed the draft AI uh, risk management framework. So my, my goal here is to, to talk through the similarities and differences emerging across jurisdictions uh, and how organizations are translating those into practice and, and what role will many of you and, and privacy professionals in general play. So, um, Karina, I, I actually want to start uh, with you. Um, the OECD AI principles uh, embraced by OECD members are, are framed as common aspirations for OECD uh, countries. Can you give us a, a few minute overview of those AI principles, how they're structured, what they drew on, and, and how they are meant to guide policy development? Um, sure, sure. So the, the OECD principles were adopted uh, early 2019 by OECD member countries and a number of partner countries as well as uh, committed to by the G20 countries. Um, and they were the first intergovernmental standard on, on artificial intelligence and basically structure all of our work today. I mean, since 2019 and um, the 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 the, the 10 principles, I'd say, are, are very similar to other such international principles, uh, like the European Commission's and others. And the idea with these principles is that as the technology evolves, um, the, the flexible principled approach uh, can remain relevant over time, including with uh, generative AI, we can still point back and, and we, have, we have guidance that is relevant there. Um, so the, the first five principles, so 
the, the principles are basically 10 principles, and the first five of which are really the most important values that uh, of like-minded countries that AI systems should reflect and the rights that should be protected. And so uh, things like equity, uh, human rights, um, human rights including privacy, democratic values and fairness, um, the important principles of transparency and explainability and safety and robustness, and also really importantly, the accountability of all actors throughout the AI system lifecycle for uh, the proper functioning of their system in a way that does not in, in, uh, create, uh, create uh, un, uh, undue risks. Uh, safety risks in particular. So the five other principles, I'm sorry, the, the microphone is um, sometimes getting very loud and sometimes not very loud, so I have to be cautious about that. Um, the, the five other principles lay out sort of key actions that policymakers need to implement to foster an AI ecosystem that can thrive on the long term and benefit societies and and this again is also similar and this is this is also similar to what we're seeing in national AI policies and regional regional AI plans like the coordinated uh, EU AI act it, it it's 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 you know the R, the 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 R and D skills jobs preparing for job transitions those kind of things where we need to sort of as policymakers think ahead and what does this mean for our existing uh, policies in areas like education or uh, employment um, and so on. So since 2019, as I mentioned, we've been moving from these principles to the hard work of implementation. Um, and with you know a, a number of initiatives with the OECD.AI Policy Observatory that we launched early 2020 um, that provides many resources on uh, the, the developments in AI on tools uh, for trust, you know, tools uh, and metrics for uh, trustworthy AI and, and, and many other um, um, functionalities. Uh, we also have a network of experts on AI that's a very large network that's organized into specific themes that I'll get into, and particularly one on risk management, one on AI futures. Um, that that are that are helping the the OECD progress, you know, helping policymakers basically, giving them, you know, alongside policymakers progressing towards better understanding what does this mean and how do we prepare for it, uh, um, or I I in some instances actually address existing already existing um, happenings, um, and so uh, they. They're, they're helping develop practical implementation guidance on AI risk and accountability on AI incidents, on uh, AI futures, as well as AI compute and climate right now. So those are the, the and, 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 and there's more work on AI education. And they, they advise the OECD uh, working party on AI governance that we call IGO, which is really the formal body. And that formal body is really, you know, the sort of um, intergovernmental body and then those those uh, the countries that are part of that, uh, which are OECD countries and many partner countries, commit to implementing those uh, in practice. Um, so that's that's a short overview. Thank you. Uh, clearly, uh, just a, an incredible amount of work that that didn't end with um, the the launch of the principles themselves. Um, so, uh, Denise, I I, I want to turn to you because, of course, Singapore was uh, among the first. Uh, countries in terms of developing an AI governance framework. Can you tell us what the model AI governance framework entails and, and how it is meant to be used? Thanks, Caitlin. Um, so I think the AI governance framework, first of all, is a voluntary framework. Um, and it reflects very much Singapore government's and IMD or PDPC stands towards um, how AI should be treated. It's not hard regulation, it is voluntary. And I think it was a recognition that um, this is a very quickly evolving space. The, any sort of intervention does need to be agile. Um, it also has to be pro-innovation. Um, and so there had to be enough space for both industry um, as well as government to move together um, to tackle sort of evolving issues. Um, so the AI governance framework was really born out of conversations among regulators who recognized that even uh, within sectors, there needed to be some sort of um, central organizing themes. Um, and it's very much aligned to OECD principles. Um, the, the focus is very much on putting in place uh, 
practices that organizers can implement um, and translating high-level policies and in into implementable practices. Very much focused, for example, on understanding the risk of the AI and then figuring out what the risk management practices are around it, understanding, for example, how human-centered it should be, um, and there's sort of 11 organizing principles that we work around. Um, it's really meant in Singapore to be the horizontal piece um, upon which sectoral regulations or interventions then dock. So for example, we worked very closely with the financial regulator, the monetary authority, who then came up with their sector specific sort of frameworks as well. Um, so we see it as quite a holistic piece and we hold that together. Um, and we also see it as fairly outcome based, fairly broad, so that we can sort of tweak and adapt um, as the technology advances. Well, thank you. That's that's particularly helpful, I, I think, for, for me to understand how it also syncs with regulation, since, as you said, this is, is voluntary, and then uh, it, it syncs up or kind of has the sectoral rules dock into it. That That's uh, particularly helpful. Uh, Yuhai, I, I want kind of to, to turn to you next because uh, I, I think we're, we're going from kind of the, the OECD principles that, that uh, all countries are, are aspiring to achieve to, to something that is um, kind of soft, soft law here. The European Commission, of course, was among the, the first to propose hard law. Um, and the EU AI Act is, is drawing a lot of attention as it works its way through Parliament, may soon enter Trilogue. Um, and I know it's evolved a lot along the way, but I want to focus first on what the European Commission itself, of course, where you sit, proposed. Can you help, the, uh, help us understand the European Commission's approach to the EU AI Act uh, and AI regulation in general and why you took that approach? Okay, thank you. Good morning. Um, yes, indeed. So we have taken the extra step, if you like, um, um, which some people call courageous, uh, some people abhorred, and others are more critical of. Um, I think uh, the, the rationale goes back quite a long way in a sense that we have, as you pointed out in the introduction, we have been crafting our AI strategy for, for a number of years, and we came out with our strategy in 2018 already, so that's now five years ago, time flies. And already then we sort of outlined the need to address not just technological aspects, but also non-technological aspects of AI. And th those include also then, of course, the uh, ethical and legal framework. And as part of this, we launched the high-level expert group uh, in 2018, which developed then the ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. And, and these were then, of course, uh, have been uh, very inspirational for the, 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 the approach we have taken. This work was done concurrently, actually, uh, with the OECD work that was ongoing. Um, they started roughly at the same time. They delivered roughly at the same time. Also, we were informed of each other's work. So um, that has inspired it. So the need, the recognition, if you like, that we need to address non-technological aspects of AI as well, because we think that the key aspect here is trust. Um, so we see this technology as potentially very beneficial, but for the benefits to materialize, we need uptake, but for the uptake, we need trust. So, so it's kind of a chain, if you like. Therefore, we felt that there was a need to address the concerns and the potential negative e effects of, of AI. Um, and we decided to go for a risk-based approach, so we approach, we don't regulate AI as technology as such, but we uh, regulate, plan to regulate certain uses of AI. So therefore, the key notion there is the high-risk uses of AI. So there is a small number of banned uses of AI, like general purpose social scoring, um, uh, sublime manipulation, 
So this is, of course, now I'm talking about the Commission proposal, the original proposal from 2021. Um, and then there is the sort of, uh, uh, if you like, safe set of uses of AI where there are no specific requirements. And then in the middle, we have, in some cases, transparency obligations, but the core is the high-risk uses of AI. So these are then AI used in safety components of already regulated products like medical devices, but also then AI used in certain specific areas like uh, the operation of, of critical infrastructure or, or um, um, access to employment and public services, things like that. Um, so the, the idea here is that in these high-risk use cases, then AI systems should uh, fulfill certain conformity requirements, fulfill requirements. So there is a conformity assessment, ex ante conformity assessment, which is done to show compliance with the requirements, which concerns things like data, um, uh, transparency, um, uh, human oversight, etc. So these requirements uh, need to be verified by means of conformity assessment uh, for these high-risk use cases. So the idea here is to intervene when it's necessary, but only when it's necessary, so that there is uh, the, 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 the ability to develop this technology to innovate Therefore, we consider this to be proportional and we consider it to be innovation friendly because it does not regulate blindly across the board, but takes into account the uses, uh, the intended uses of the systems. So that's in a nutshell how we go about it. Thank you. I'm going to have this. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, and, and we'll come back to you, I think, a little bit later because your last point um, on intended uses, I think, has gotten a lot of attention as uh, the EU AI Act has worked through Parliament since those intended uses, of course, might not always be known, um, as, as we've seen with some of the latest developments. Um, I just wanted to mention for our audience to, to give you a heads up that we will devote a, a fair bit of time, uh, 20 to 30 minutes at the end, to your question. So please do be thinking about what you'd like to ask our, our panelists um, so that we'll have some so good questions. Um, but Dennis, I, I want to turn to you now. Um, so uh, these uh, three policy uh, uh, instruments, let's say, are are just a few of, of hundreds of instruments and frameworks and guidance documents that we've seen over the last uh, several years. Uh, you have been studying uh, and, and researching AI governance for, for quite some years now, surveying companies on their approaches uh, in practice. Based on your research and engagement, how are organizations currently uh, approaching and implementing AI governance, and, and particularly in the absence of, of hard law, since we know that that's not really here yet. Thank you, Caitlin. And I think it's a relevant question also because of the amount of policy that's being developed, which of course we want it to be developed in relation to the practices that are going on. It will be most effective, I think, if it's developed in relation to the practices that are going on. So it's worth knowing about that. Um, we did an initial interview uh, and survey-based research project in 2018, 2019. We published the results of that in 2021. We have a forthcoming book with Springer that will also convey the results of that research. We really focused on how companies were, and, and we focused on US-based private sector companies. We could have done something similar for public sector organizations this was our focus. Um, how they were managing, how they were governing AI and the risks from AI, who in the organization was responsible for this, and why they were doing this in the absence of law, in the absence of legal requirements to do so. Uh, and we are currently um, conducting a second round, a second survey-based project, uh, in partnership with the IAPP, who is very helpfully um, uh, use some of its resources to distribute the survey. And we're focusing on updating our current research, especially on how companies are doing this. And also, I think we can now ask what, if any, value they're getting uh, from these activities. So we're going to explore that, or we are exploring that in the current survey. 
uh, be able to give you a preview of some of the points from that survey work today. Um, but you asked me, you know, what are companies currently doing and what resources are they drawing on in the absence of direct laws? Um, I think it's actually helpful to divide what companies are doing into two main categories. Um, one is what I would call governance through technology, and the other is governance through human ethical judgment. Um, governance through technology involves technical strategies for aligning AI more with our values, things like differential privacy, mathematical definitions of fairness and how to achieve them, et cetera. Um, this area has gotten a lot of attention and rightly so, it's highly important, but it's not the only important dimension. Organizations also have to make judgment calls about which uses of AI are ethical and appropriate and which are not. For example, should companies infer the emotional, use AI to infer the emotional states of customers who call into them and share that information with their call center representatives? You know, you can make arguments on both sides. It's not a straightforward issue, um, but a judgment call has to be made about that. And there's no technical solution to that. It's a human judgment that has to be made. The data ethics managers that we talk to often call these the should we questions. We can do it technically, we can do it legally, but should we? So our research focused on how these companies were deciding these should be questions, how they were determining what's ethical and responsible and what's not. And based on our interviews, um, we identified five main components to these AI governance programs. Top level commitment, substantive standards, management processes, management structures, and culture building efforts. So very briefly, Top level commitment, we heard nothing happens unless those at the top say it, it must happen. So getting buy-in from your C-suite, it turns out, was very important. Substantive standards, you're trying to decide what is ethical and appropriate and what is not. So you need some standards for drawing those lines to decide whether a given opportunity, a given project, is on one side of that line or the other. You have to draw those lines. You need substantive standards. Of course, AI ethics principles uh, of the type that the OECD very much led on um, you know, are part of that, but they're very high level. They often don't actually give you enough to make a determinate decision. You need more operational policies. And so how to arrive at those is a question. Management processes um, for ensuring that the organization's operations and products and services stay within the ethical lines that it has drawn. And we see things like AI impact assessments. We see AI ethics checklists. We see environmental scans of what other companies are doing. We see ethical risk scanning. We see red teaming. We see stakeholder engagement. These are all processes that companies have been adopting to try and align their operations and, and work with, with the values that they've articulated. Well, who's in charge of this? What's the management structure? Um, who is responsible for making sure that the processes are followed and so the organization stays within its ethical lines? Um, and so we saw that emerge, a kind of a management structure around AI governance, including, and it's not universal, right, really varies by organization, some kind of responsible person, be it an AI ethics officer or some similar title, which could be combined with another position like the CPO. Perhaps a committee for deciding the hard should we questions and for developing AI ethics policy. Sometimes it's called an AI ethics committee, for example, or a responsible AI committee. Um, it's usually cross-functional with representatives from many different components, relevant components of the organization. AI ethics champions embedded in the frontline units to kind of communicate the values and spot issues and escalate them to the more central decision makers. Perhaps an external advisory board of um, former regulators or advocates or dare I say academics um, to give another perspective and sensitize the company to issues that it may not be aware of. 
And of course, increasing diversity in your data science teams, right, as a way also of sensitizing yourself to more issues. So those are all structural things that companies were doing um, to advance this cause. And finally, building an AI ethics culture. And we heard that this was essential really to all of the above. You know, if you get a AI ethics checklist, what spirit do you fill that out in? If you're a if you're a data scientist, you know, do you just quickly check the box and move on or do you take it seriously and really engage with it? That's very much a question of culture. So how do you build an AI ethics culture? So we saw things like AI ethics book groups or interest groups. We saw ethical bounties. We saw making AI ethics part of performance reviews. So um, these are the things you know, that we saw top level commitment, substantive standards, management processes, management structures, um, and building an AI ethics culture. Of course, there's more, but to kind of distill, distill it into some understandable categories, um, that's what we saw. You asked what resources people were drawing on in 2018 and 2019, there wasn't much. Um, most of the, the, some resources that we saw came out of kind of industry, aligned think tanks. Um, for example, the, the F Future of Privacy Forum had its big data benefit risk analysis. That was an early thing. The um, Information Accountability Foundation created the Ethical Accountability Framework for the Hong Kong Office of the Privacy Commissioner. That was another early and I think influential document. But by and large, these companies were flying by the seat of their pants and trying to invest this um, as they went. Today, there's much more. Um, there's the NIST AI Risk Management Framework. There's Singapore's Model Governance Framework. Uh, the World Economic Forum uh, and its Empowering AI Leadership Publications has put out some really useful material. Um, the high-level expert group uh, that we already heard about from the EU has put out some useful things. And that's, there's a lot more than that. So there's much more for companies to look at and work with today. Uh, Dennis. Thank you so much. I, for, for me in particular, trying to think about how this is being operationalized by those on the ground, uh, kind of going from uh, the, the policy level conversation to that practical is, is particularly helpful. And uh, I, I can't help but think of the privacy profession when you start asking, should we, questions, right? I think that's something so many of us have grappled with uh, over the years uh, and the kind of cross-disciplinary nature of this that necessitates these structures within organizations certainly sounds uh, a lot uh, like privacy. And in, in our own research, we have found that uh, in, in more than 50% of the cases, privacy professionals are being handed the AI governance uh, file building on top of privacy programs. So I, I, I think that makes a, a lot of sense. But, but I, I do want to kind of come back to our, our um, our international kind of cross uh, jurisdictional conversation here because not everyone is uh, approaching this the same way. And uh, Karine, I, I wanna turn to you working uh, very directly across countries. Um, you have the, the benefit of, of that and perhaps know where the skeletons are, are buried from some of the negotiations to develop the OECD AI principles. Can, can you speak to some of the, the challenges and opportunities that, that you see as you look to the evolving international landscape and, and perhaps help us kind of merge uh, some of these ideas in terms of uh, what role do risk management frameworks uh, continue to play alongside legislation? Um, I, I'd say, you know, and this is, uh, I think, an OECD point of view, and it's also my personal point of view that they're very complementary, and, and you have explained how the, much of the implementation of the EU AI Act, for example, is going to go through uh, standards which are going to be, to some extent, risk management standards, which are going to adapt to the risk of given, uh, given systems. So uh, I, th I see a lot of um, commonalities. And um, one, I think everyone is grappling with the implications of AI developments today, particularly with generative AI, which is kind of, th you know, creating a whole 
whole new slew of issues. Uh, but, but AI policy is an international challenge, um, meaning that uh, local and regional solutions are, developments are very important, but are part of the solution um, because because the AI because AI systems are often available globally and um, and bring a lot of benefits. So uh, many countries don't want to limit those benefits. They would like to do it, you know, have be able to control the AI systems and how they're used, but they don't they don't want to limit it either, uh, and they don't want their businesses to suffer from that limitation. So, so. Um, um, I think, and we're seeing legislation, of course, in the EU, which is which is the most advanced. But there are lots of other uh, uh, initiatives in, in in Canada, China, Brazil. Uh, there's the U.S. blueprint. We'll see where that goes. But um, um, I think, from our perspective, there's a bit of a risk with different frameworks for, um, um, d you know, a, a risk that these lead to diverging requirements on companies that are operating internationally across borders. Uh, so it's not necessarily a problem for large companies who can afford to have an ethic and, you know, an AI risk management function that's very well developed, that's been there for, uh, for, for decades, and, and then in a, a separate uh, AI uh, ethics uh, component. But those really are, per, to date, two different communities and companies as far as uh, in, in our exchanges, that's come forward quite closely, particularly in the large companies. Uh, but at some point, if you want to bring in all the companies operating internationally, and there are many of them, they won't necessarily be able to have those two separate functions and um, staff them appropriately and, and so on. And therefore, and, and at the end of the day, when you're talking about risk management frameworks, they're standard, they're standard frameworks. Uh, there, there are AI specificities that need to be taken into account and there's upskilling needed um, within companies, but also with, of course, with regulators. Um, and, and what we're trying to do um, what we think is 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 an interesting avenue, and also a low hanging fruit for the OECD is uh, we have due diligence guidance for 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 responsible business conduct. Um, that's a semi binding tool which has uh, an enforcement mechanism through national contact points and applies to many countries and works fairly well. Resolves many disputes through arbitration and mediation. It's a it's a, it's a quick it's a it's a it's it's a complementary and possibly uh, useful tool because not everyone has the resources to go through national courts uh, and therefore you know uh, having having a, a lighter mechanism could be can be helpful as long as the, the values are aligned and there is always the recourse to national courts with uh, the the OECD. Uh, uh, due diligence guidance for responsible business conduct. So that's what we've been working on. And now this is not a new framework. So this is really important to, to, to highlight that what we're working on is not a new framework. It's mapping together the existing frameworks and the frameworks that are under development, for example, in Sense and in EC as, as, as they progress. Um, and, and to really, what we're trying to do is build functional equivalence be, between those frameworks that are Risk management frameworks specific to AI, of course, NIST, ISO, and many others, um, and by by functional equivalence, sometimes called interoperability, we don't mean harmonization. Far from it. There's never going to be harmonization, but really be a, being able to establish equivalence at some levels. It'll never be a hundred percent, as I said, but it's to say, if you're a small business and you've gone through 70% uh, of, of the requirements of, of, of this risk management framework, uh, IEEE's for example, then here are the remaining steps for you to, you know, just make life easier so that it, it and, and we feel that by making life easier on the businesses that have to implement these obligations, uh, it will make the, um, the frameworks more effective um, and uh, more enforceable at the end of the day, because then there's a complaint mechanism, and then there's there's recourse, um, and 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 so that that's really the focus of focus area. Um, and if you look into the details of these frameworks that we've been taking stock of, they, there are very many similarities, and there are a few differences, but we can map them. It's it's the problem is that the. Unless you're, you have the time or, uh, to, or you're a risk management expert and you have the time to dig into it, they might look like 
completely different standards, but actually they're very similar. They have the same components and maybe they're structured differently. Maybe they have, the terminology is different. So here, this is this is what we're really focusing on. Um, another another um, another focus that we have is really about uh, the you know uh, trying to promote again not interoperability is a sensitive word and I don't quite understand why, but you know functional. We, you know, functional equivalence is, is, I think, maybe less touchy. I don't know yet. <laughs> we have to ask our, our colleagues. I, I, um, but, uh, you know, it, another example where it's very important to have functional equivalence or interoperability as, you know, depending on what you mean by interoperability is really pertaining to AI incident reporting and monitoring where we're working very closely with the, the commission, with the United States, with uh, many others, um, so that we have one framework for uh, reporting and tracking, monitoring AI incidents, so that we know what's happened in the past, what went wrong, what are the risks that we thought were, you know, we, we imagined might happen that did or did not materialize, and what about those risks that we didn't foresee and that did materialize into actual harms? And so that's that's another um, point where we really need this international cooperation because we don't want to be reproducing uh, harms that occur in one jurisdiction and another jurisdiction. So it's it's just I mean it's nitty gritty work. It's tracking. It's it's uh, it's it's classifying and it's 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 a it's a database and it's 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 not not glamorous but it's very very important and it's also important to inform the future um, and then um, uh, and then I, I already mentioned the the, the risk management uh, and the different phases which uh, we'll get into I think later. Yeah, no, thank you. And I I, I think that the complexities of the international landscape are are. Uh, very quickly being recognized uh, by industry. I, I think if I'm uh, remembering correctly, just in the last week, we saw the, the head of OpenAI call for an uh, international organization to, to sort this all out. So uh, I expect lots to come in, in your world. But uh, uh, Yuha, I want to turn back to you um, because Kareen uh, spoke a, a fair bit there about the, the risk management uh, approach. And uh, as you said, the EU AI Act is, is largely predicated on high risk, risk uses of AI. But as we all know, uh, uses are, are often not predetermined in this space and instead sometimes decided by organizations implementing AI systems, particularly for general purpose AI. So uh, when when I spoke uh, at our, our summit uh, in DC with the EU rapporteur uh, for the AI Act, Brando Benifi, uh, he said the, uh, the act was evolving to, to address this. And um, uh, I understand that as it went through parliament, it, it has. Um, can, can you speak to how each of the institutions, the parliament, the council, the commission is proposing to respond to some of the uh, recent uh, developments in generative AI. So, uh, first of all, uh, we'll have to bear in mind that the commission uh, published its proposal two years ago. Um, even less than a year ago, I would not have got this question. Um, but um, it's not to say that the, the, the proposal, original proposal made by the Commission would have no provisions uh, that would uh, be related to foundational AI models or generative AI because, of course, if they are used in high-risk areas, used in, in, uh, in uh, uh, those kinds of areas where we have identified the need to, to take precautions, if you like, then, of course, they would come under the requirements of, of the AI Act. Uh, so the requirements specified there would apply and the provider would have to then go through the conformity assessment. Now, um, as the council was discussing and it published its, its position in early, early December, of course, things had evolved and uh, they, to put it in a nutshell, they basically uh, uh, identified uh, general purpose AI, as they call it, uh, as, a, as a kind of high risk category as such. Uh, except if the provider of that, uh, that those systems specifically exclude high high risk uses, uh, and there are then obligations to cooperate with downstream providers who may be then fine tuning and uh, adapting these models for their own own purpose. Um, 
and then the parliament, of course, uh, has its uh, approach where it's it's kind of diversified a bit. So it, it looks at gen general purpose AI, it looks at foundational models and generative AI, and has slightly different uh, different ideas than in each case. So. So for the general purpose AI, it's also got these kinds of obligations to, as proposed by the council, to uh, to cooperate with the downstream providers. Um, and uh, uh, but as such, it was not uh, um, classified as as high risk. Then foundational models. Uh, so there um, uh, there are requirements for the development stage which uh, in some cases perhaps go beyond what was specified in the commission proposal as high risk. So these con concern predictability, interpretability, et cetera. And uh, then um, the, the uh, third category is related to generative AI. So there are basically here already kind of a terminological distinction. And there are then certain additional obligations uh, like transparency obligations. So there is a, now a process uh, starting which relates to reconciling the differences and finding a, the right solution in, in these cases to arrive at uh, the, the kind of conclusion which enables us then to adopt the, the, the AI Act. Now it would not be appropriate for me to speculate where this is heading and how it's going to be uh, to, to be shaping up because that is a process which takes months. We are hoping to, we, we have a goal of having this uh, AI Act adopted by the end of the year. So, so we'll see then how it, uh, how it works out, if it's, if it's feasible or not. But obviously these discussions now uh, are quite important and this is going to be in the so-called trilogues. So this is the, the, the sort of negotiations or discussions between the three EU institutions so the Council, the Parliament, and the Commission uh, to, to find a compromise position. So this is, of course, one of the things. There are other things, of course, in the different proposals, but certainly given also the, the, the attention uh, generative AI or large AI models uh, attracts, I mean, obviously, this is going to be one of the big questions. Uh, it's remarkable, regardless of almost of the topic of this more specific topic of the event, if it's AI, generative AI is always going to, you know, enter the stage in a big way in these discussions. So obviously, we'll see. So time will tell. Uh, so watch this space then. Uh, so, so much to watch there. And, and the idea that we could have a, a regulation in the EU by the end of the year is, is certainly striking. Uh, and the, the deliberations around whether general purpose should always kind of at the outset be considered uh, high risk, uh, certainly will have real effects for, for so many. Um, Denise, I, I understand there's also a lot of evolution uh, going on in Singapore, of course, understandably, um, and that uh, you have several uh, additional AI initiatives underway. Uh, can, you, can you tell us about those, including changes uh, that, that you expect to address the developments we're seeing in, in generative AI? Um, so I think we've heard quite a bit about the so numerous frameworks, governance structures, guidance worldwide, and we're quite aware of this and also the cross-border nature of AI products and services. Uh, we felt that the companies need to have a way to meet the different governance requirements uh, without incurring prohibitive compliance costs. Uh, we also think that objective testing of systems is important. Um, and interoperability uh, between, or oh, as you say, functional equivalence between different um, governance frameworks. Uh, also needing to build capability and capacity to demonstrate ability to comply. Um, and so Singapore developed a product called AI Verify, which is an AI governing governance testing framework and software toolkit, uh, which helps companies to validate the performance of their AI systems vis-a-vis -vis internationally recognized governance principles and allows companies to be more transparent about their AI. It is based on the model governance framework that I mentioned just now, uh, which again is aligned to the OECD uh, principles. Um, it comprises both technical tests as well as process checks, so bringing together two elements that Dennis mentioned. Uh, about both technical capability, but also judgment. Um, and it, right now it's in, in, in an MVP stage. It's, it's 
specifically for supervised learning smaller models, um, but we have had um, almost 50 global companies testing with us, providing us with use cases. And there is, um, so we have some announcements coming up, which I won't be able to share today, uh, but coming up quite soon um, to expand that um, and to make sure that it is um, able to evolve as a testing toolkit in order to meet um, the evolving uh, models uh, that AI is bringing to us. Uh, we're also actively pursuing um, functional equivalence with international frameworks. As a small country for us, this is important. Um, and for example, we're working very closely with US NIST um, to map AI Verify with NIST AI Risk Management Framework. And we will want to work actively with the international standards community, as well as other governments on AI governance. Um, and your question lastly on generative AI, I mean, it's an exciting space. Um, there are a lot of new developments. Um, we believe that the governance principles in the AI model governance framework, which is ultimately about accountability, is still important. And we're looking to build on that um, and to update it uh, to cope with the so two unique characteristics of generative AI, which is really its foundational nature. Um, and the sort of different layers um, and complexity of shared responsibility between um, the foundation model developers as well as the application layer deployers of that technology um, and then what that means means vis-a-vis -vis the end user. Um, so we will be articulating some views on that. Um, and we'll also look specifically at adapting measures um, to address safety in both development and implementation, as well as output um, specifically on online safety and misinformation and disinformation. Well, well thank you. Uh, very exciting uh, to, to hear you have more coming here, but also really appreciate kind of the effort to help companies bridge uh, across borders. Um, I'm just going to flag for our audience that I'm going to, uh, I, I, are, I have more questions for our panelists, but I'm going to go to Dennis next and then come to you so we can feed yours in and then and then I'll uh, hold some of mine uh, for the end because I want to make sure we get you engaged here. Um, Dennis, I want to come to you um, in particular to help us understand who within organizations uh, is, is doing this work? I, I shared some of our research that it's often being handed uh, to, to privacy uh, teams, but, but as uh, our panelists have flagged, they, they have a lot to learn and, and need to leverage uh, individuals across organizations, whether it's on safety or explainability or IP protections uh, or uh, misinformation, so much more. Uh, so how are teams being structured and, and does it seem to be working? And I know you have a few slides uh, to share with us. Uh, so first of all, I think I just want to provide a bit of context uh, for the data I'm going to present. Um, and part of that comes from the data itself. So you can see this is in our 2023 survey. To what extent have responsible AI management practices been implemented at your company? The, the greatest number of respondents said somewhat, right? Uh, you have a few to a large extent and a few to a very large extent, um, but it, it's, it's largely in the somewhat category. So this is an evolving area, right? Um, and, and, and we expect the nature of the governance and perhaps who is managing it to evolve over time. And this is another interesting response, I think, is your co company's process for making AI ethics judgment calls ad hoc or systematic. For the majority, it's ad hoc. There's not a system, not a management process in place yet. Again, I, I would think, you know, three, five years from now, we're going to get very different results. But this, the, we're, we're at an early stage in this AI governance field. And I think it's worth keeping that in mind as we think about who's doing it. Um, the other thing I'll mention, also kind of as, as a bit of a caveat to our study, you know, it's really difficult to get people, to find the people who know about the AI ethics management and to get them to respond to your survey. So we have had 
good success in finding people, but the survey samples are small. Uh, in our 2019 survey, we had 26 survey respondents. Um, in the current one, we have you know something less than 100 right now, where our data collection is continuing. So, and the companies that we are getting responses from are generally large companies, um, you know, that have are doing a lot with AI and have the resources to start to really put AI governance practices into place. They are the ones who are responding, right? They have enough to say to respond to these surveys. So this is a limited snapshot, okay? And it's a snapshot in time. That said, I think there's some useful things that we can see. And I'll start, um, these were our 2019 survey results. Who in your company has primary responsibility for managing ethical risks associated with big data analytics? Some things that I think are worth noting here 10%, no one in particular, right? We have not assigned this responsibility yet. Privacy officer and legal and compliance are the two main categories and kind of splitting each about a third. Um, and then we see the beginnings of the data ethics officer. We, we interviewed, um, uh, you know, we, 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 we were able to identify some of the first data ethics officers um, emerging at that time. Uh, and so you see that starting to grow. Um, we didn't ask about data scientists or data analytics managers, uh, but um, if they were to be the ones handling this, they would come in the other category, so they'd be 7% or less, okay? So let me now share what we're seeing in 2023. And again, it's not a completely apples to apples, right? It's di perhaps different companies. We don't know who, who's responding, it's all anonymous. Um, but, and the question is not entirely the same. Again, kind of more caveats, but I think there's, there's something useful to be seen here. So nobody responded, no one in particular, okay? Um, that has changed. Um, we're seeing a, a slight shift away from the privacy officer or from the legal compliance privacy from 32% in 2018, 2019, to 24% in 2023, more of a shift uh, down in the legal or compliance uh, to 14% from 32. Um, increase on C-suite and senior manager, I think perhaps reflecting the increased importance of this area. Um, increase, although not dramatic, in the data ethics officer, I think that position is still emerging. Um, and a, the real, real increase is in the data scientists and analytics managers, right? From 7% or less in 2018-19 in to 22% here. So that's a real growth. Um, you know, we could see some benefits to this trend. Uh, I think the data scientists and data analytics managers are more, you know, understand better the technological solutions and they're good people to bring that to the table. And I think from some of the conversations we've had, they also have incentives um, to make sure that their company's AI ethics operation, you know, is, is not hurting people and they're not, you know, damaging the company's reputation if, 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 if they are, it will come back to them. So they have an incentive to attend to this. Um, but I also think there are downsides in this shift to the data science, data analytics managers. Perhaps too much focus on the technological solutions. Um, they are not as familiar, I would think, with the management and process approaches, approaches with the ethical and legal and policy dimensions. Um, they are not as experienced in making those judgment calls about how you know to balance ethical imperatives with business imperatives. Um, that's not their work as much as it is, for example, the work of legal or the work of privacy officers. Um, they're not as familiar with the management processes. Caitlin, you were mentioning, you know, a lot of what we were seeing companies do sounds similar in the privacy area. I think about AI 
impact assessments, and I immediately think about privacy impact assessments. So I think there's a bunch of knowledge about the management that we see um, in, in privacy. There's a bunch of experience in making these judgment calls that we see in legal that we don't have as much in the data science managers. Uh, and I think there's a risk to having the person who's in charge of the AI business unit also be in charge of governing the AI business unit, right? There's a fox guarding the hen house um, issue here. Um, so in some ways, I like the 2019 distribution perhaps better than the 2023. Um, but again, we'll see how this evolves. I, I, and, and our sample size is small. I do not claim that it's representative, but I think it, it gives us a sense perhaps of where things are headed. But I expect this to continue evolving. And the IAPP's AI governance initiative indeed you know, may, may have some effect on this as well. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I think what these numbers say to me is is that, as you said, this is evolving so quickly, and I think we all know it needs to scale so quickly. Our our own separate research uh, found that in 40% of cases, organizations are using privacy impact assessments, as you said, for uh, or leveraging them for their AI impact assessment. So we are still seeing a lot of that overlap. But uh, let me open it up to, to your questions uh, right here uh, in the front. Yes, please. Yes. Can you hear me? All right. Mary Hickok, uh, President of Center for AI and Digital Policy. Um, since the EU Act was uh, drafted and proposed, we had concerns about the self-assessment of conformity. We have more concerns with uh, some of the recent developments, starting from the Council's general approach to the uh, recent vote and uh, committees on an additional layer of assessing significant risk. Uh, and that is, again, a self-assessment by the companies, whether they, even whether they are in the high-risk areas uh, in Annex 3, there is now, they can now ask a question uh, and assess themselves whether to be significant risk. I think my question is, you how about to the rest as well? Do you consider that to, uh, be an obstacle to the effectiveness of the regulation, and whether that can make some of the con some of the protections obsolete going forward. A company can say, "I'm not a significant risk." AI Act does not ap apply to me. Oh. So. Yeah, thank you for the question. So, um, a couple of points uh, I would like to, to make in that regard. Firstly, uh, not all conformity assessment is self-assessment. So, it's true it's, it's a, a component of it, but for example, the safety systems which already undergo uh, uh, third-party conformity assessment, you know, in those cases where AI is used, they of course also go uh, undergo a third-party conformity assessment. Um, this was also in the Commission proposal for, for biometric identification. Uh, so in those cases, in any case, the third party conformity assessment. Um, this decision was considered to be a balanced way of approaching it to avoid uh, too much burden, but to ensure nevertheless that there is uh, conformity with the legislation and there are safeguards in place. I think one key element here to remember is that uh, once the conformity assessment has been done, that's not the end of the story. So there's also post-market surveillance, uh, which then uh, kicks in and uh, therefore things are not cast in stone forever. Uh, if, if it turns out, for example, then that uh, a certain uh, use, uh, a certain system uh, is not in compliance with the requirements of the, the, the act, then of course uh, there, will be, there are mechanisms to, to, to deal with this. So those are the points I would like to make in regard uh, with your question. 
Thank you so much. Did anyone else want to jump in on that? Otherwise, we'll pick up another one. Okay, um, Philip. Hi, good morning. My name is Philip Reth. I'm the Chief Privacy Officer of Allianz Insurer. Um, and I guess my question is also for you, hi. Uh, my understanding of the EU AI Act is that also then the users will have to mitigate certain risk. And I'm especially interested in the human control. And um, the human control, how, how will that work and how intense will it be? I mean, does a human always have to check then high risk AI decisions or is it ad hoc at human uh, complaints, for example? And what about AI which is not classified as high risk? Is there then no human control necessary. Thank you. So um, this is going into quite some detail about uh, the implementation, but uh, indeed there are obligations not just for providers, but also users. Uh, so they are supposed to also report incidents and, and uh, they should also be part of this mechanism and in, ensure human oversight. Now how then that will work out in practice, that, that needs to be still resolved. Uh, but indeed, uh, the, the providers, although this AI Act follows the kind of uh, product uh, uh, product safety logic, if you like, that's the kind of rationale, and as was mentioned earlier, it's fully implemented by means of standards. Uh, there is then, uh, of course, the, the, the requirement for the users uh, to, first of all, of course, use the systems according to the instructions and the documentation, which is an obligation on the on the providers. So the providers will have to give the necessary documentation and instructions on how to use it. But then, of course, they will have to report incidents. Uh, how some of the, the details then will work out in practice, that's a, that's a more thorny issue that, of course, uh, needs, uh, needs to be worked out. Thank you. Uh, Cam Carey. Thank you. Uh, I'm Cam Carey of the Brookings Institution um, uh, and lead a project there on international cooperation on AI. And I want to pick up a little bit on, on what Kareen and Yuha talked about in terms of incident reporting. Um, you know, it's it's maybe a little bit in the weeds, except that that you know it it implies an understanding. Of, you know, what is an incident? What are the some agreements on what the the risks are, and you know, really needs input from the private sector and other researchers and developers. So, Corinne, you you mentioned. Uh, uh, that you know, that's part of the OECD's work. You, I think you said the U.S. and uh, the EU are working on that, and it's part of the U.S.-EU Trade and Technology Council. So how does that feed into the OECD work? And you know, can you both talk a little bit about sort of what levels of agreement there are on the scope of incident reporting? Thanks, thanks, Cam. Uh, so this, I don't want to get too excited because I love this project. I this is I, I found, find this project fascinating. There's two facets to it. One part of it is establishing a monitoring framework. So what is it that we want to know about each individual incident? What type of incident? What type of AI system are we talking about? What type of data input? What type of model? What type of output? What type of harm? What you know? So one is establishing a monitoring framework. And, and so that's a group of people, of experts from all stakeholder groups with one chair, uh, chair from the European Commission, chairs from, from other uh, important bodies. So the idea here with the framework itself is that you're not, the original idea here is not to end up in, in the situation that we had 20 years ago with, with the product safety. Uh, global recalls of, of, of 
re recalls of unsafe products where we had, we each had, all the jurisdictions had their own databases that were not interoperable and therefore incidents that happened in the jurisdictions would happen elsewhere because there was no way for them to know that these products had been deemed unsafe elsewhere. And so we want to have a common basic minimalistic, well, not, not necessarily multi-layered framework that would allow for both uh, compulsory, in some cases, incident reporting and voluntary reporting as appropriate, uh, but also sectoral reporting in some cases because, you know, f for example, in the current EU AI Act proposal mandates the reporting of serious AI incidents, which is a specific, which has a specific definition, but you can very well imagine that specific other jurisdictions will mandate the reporting of incidents in the medical sector or, or, or in specific high risk sectors uh, of, of, of their own choosing, um, be it nuclear or, or, or whatever. So, so we're trying to have a, 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 a establish a framework that's flexible enough. That's strand one of the work, and so that's really an expert group, uh, and that, that's going through intergovernmental processes because we want, at the end of the day, this, this framework that is developed in a multi-stakeholder manner to be endorsed by governments so that they can have the same framework, um, uh, uh, an inter functionally equivalent interoperable, I avoid the word now interoperable, but in any case, interoperable, in this case I think it's appropriate, interoperable, so that you're asking for the same fields, you're, 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 you're quantifying the same levels of severity of harm. So the second component, which is also very exciting, uh, is an automated um, uh, monitoring of AI incidents in a, pro in a first instance based on news. So based on the news, uh, worldwide news in all the languages, in all the news outlets in the world, with of course a, a lot of, um, of tweaking based on the reputation of the news, news sources and excluding bots and things like that. Um, and, and that's also fascinating work because it shows you, well, where things are materializing now. This is very interesting in showing us what's happened in the past, what types of systems have generated harms, but it's also limited because it only shows us what is being reported by the press. So that is possibly just the tip of the iceberg. We don't know for the time being. Uh, so we're looking at other sources like case law. We're looking at um, things like um, scientific publications, which would explain specific incidents. Um, but, but that's very interesting. And for example, the, the growth trend with over the past few months is, is, is phenomenal. And then look at digging into, you know, with generative AI, digging into what types of issues have materialized is, is absolutely fascinating. And, and we're doing that automatically, so through classifiers. And because we're not going to be able to, we think, for now, we have been able to keep track. We developed a manual training database, tra training set, um, uh, but we're not going, we don't think it scales. So that, that's what, that, those are the two, two strands. And, and again, it's working very closely with the commission. So that's really looking at the past and the present because it is real time. But it doesn't give us, and it, it can give us some indications about the future if, if you, but we all know the future doesn't necessarily look like the past, and there, that's why we're also working on foresight. And so trends with foresight experts and foresight methodologies, um, uh, which is a separate exercise, but trying to cover the, 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 the most important risks. So you had... Very briefly, in order not in, in the interest of time. So, indeed, in the uh, EU US Trade and Technology Council, we published this AI roadmap. Uh, and um, um, this is basically composed of three main elements. And one of them is, you know, looking at uh, existing and emerging risks. And, um, and we there uh, want to, we, we are fully aware, of course, of the work that the OECD is doing. And uh, in that work, we want to take into account, of course, and, and find synergies with the OECD work, do complementary work rather than an open a parallel track, which is doing the same thing. We don't obviously want to waste resources like that uh, because we don't have the resources to waste. So, so we need to do that in a way which is complementary and, and supportive. So we talk to the OECD in the context of the, of the Trade and Technology Council, of course, to understand 
what they are doing to build on what they are doing to, to, to see then how the OECD can relate its work to what we are doing. But, but we find this a very valuable piece and interesting piece of work going forward in the Trade and Technology Council uh, because, of, because of things that happen all the time. A week is a long time, not only in politics, but also in AI. Um, well, I, I, clearly, we could we could spend a whole lot more time on this. We know uh, there there is so much happening and and so much still uh, to learn. So I didn't even get back to the the last questions uh, that I wanted, but very much appreciating and respecting my CPDP colleagues, we will we will stop here. Please join me in in thanking uh, our thoughtful panelists for being with us today.